So, Dr. Alegria, I really want to thank you first for taking the time to speak with me today. And given that we have worked together in the past, I'm going to refer to you as Maggie going forward. Absolutely. Um, but um, so I wanted to start off our interview first by asking you to say a little bit about um, how you came to your research and how um, your experience of being a clinician informs the work that you do today. Well, I actually uh, started my research career um, very right after my master's. I did my master's in psychology and soon after um, got invited to work first as a clinician with who used to be the chair of the department. He had his private practice mm -hmm. and uh, he invited me to be part of it. And it was a fantastic experience. I worked 16 years as a clinician, mm. um, working with many, many different families. Um, I used to do all the way from children to couples to mm -hmm. families, um, adults. Uh, so it was a great experience in giving you a profile also of the circumstances uh, for why people come to care. Mm -hmm. uh, it also showed me the challenges in being a clinician, which are, I think, extremely hard, especially in this era. Mm -hmm. um, starting with the focus on productivity, to issues of trying to handle uh, your practice at the same time you're trying to handle child care issues mm -hmm. um, and all the issues that people had in terms of trying the boundaries mm -hmm. um, people would call me you know at different times I was very open to people calling me if they had problems mm -hmm. so it really uh, spills over to your life right. where things become um, you, you understand how important you are in terms of helping people. Mm -hmm. But also you, you get a, a feel for uh, how people have different circumstances that affect their lives mm -hmm. uh, and that everyone's very different. I think one thing that helped me in terms of clinical care was seeing how each case was so different from others. I mean, I think you you think that you're gonna get a lot of training, but when you start uh, seeing your clients, you find yourself with more questions than answers. And you're actually starting to think, oh my God, I didn't get training this, or I didn't get training that. Mm -hmm. um, that helped me in terms of thinking about what are the issues right. uh, that I think clinicians confront today, but also that patients confront today. Um, from there, I actually started, I was offered uh, an academic position in a public health school, and I, I think that was marvelous okay. uh, because I actually work in all sorts of issues uh, with many marginalized populations. So I did a lot of work on HIV and sex workers. I, I did a lot of work uh, that had to do with um, youth, um, divorce women, um, fertility, abortion, you name it. Uh, we had to do a lot of uh, research topics like that. But it allowed me to see not only the individual components of the therapeutic relationship, mm -hmm. but also the social conditions. Mm -hmm. That Those um, 20 years that I spent at the School of Public Health, I was able to see like how policy Mm -hmm. uh, makes a big dent in the opportunities people have, mm -hmm. um, especially with the sex worker study. Uh, I was struck by how little opportunities people had in terms of getting education, getting services, uh, that some of the barriers were not really uh, intrapsychic or more from the person themselves, but actually had to do more with government and what services are available to certain populations. So for example, if you have a substance abuse problem, you're curtail of many services. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good example. So I, I had a great opportunity to see both sides. Right, right. That's wonderful. And, and I think, you know, knowing about your research, it really shows in the depth of your thoughtfulness and how you frame your research questions and your research agenda. Which actually brings me to my next question for you, for people that don't know your research, if you could say a little bit about um, 
kind of um, how you how would you describe your research and and the agenda kind of uh, where you are now and kind of where where you think you're going in the future with it? So, I think people would probably characterize my agenda as very broad because I think I. I've gone all the way from doing work in psychiatric epidemiology, doing work uh, in health services research, uh, doing work uh, in community uh, participatory research, uh, doing clinical trials, um, and doing more now work on community uh, interventions. So I think people would see me all over the place. And I think it, it People might think I'm, I don't have a lot of focus, but I actually think that um, some of the things I'm very interested in changing are things that require a multi-level perspective. So I'm very interested, for example, in understanding what are the big macro problems that um, have to do with service delivery, mm -hmm. particularly mental health and substance abuse. Um, but then when you start doing mental health and substance abuse, you go into a whole realm of other areas. But I'm very interested in how, what is the difference? And I think we started doing work on uh, Latinos and Asian Americans and seeing how they're very different. And some of the issues that are significant for them might be quite different than the issues for mainstream populations. So I think that that was very useful. I think the second thing is I'm very interested in issues that have to do with patient-provider interaction. Mm -hmm. I see that as uh, eroding and people having less of an interest in connecting to providers because the life of providers is so different today. So I got very worried about how that interpersonal relationship is changing um, for what I think is the worst. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving into that area. Then I went into the area in doing some work in health services research and finding first disparities, but actually very, very poor quality of care. So that got me very interested in issues that have to do with, okay, what, what can we offer people mm -hmm. that ties more with what they can do, it's feasible for them, and it's good quality care? Uh, how can we engage them, even if they don't think they need this? And so that has been pretty much the work I've been doing currently. And I think the next step that I'm starting to do has to do more with how can we do interventions that are more community-based, mm -hmm. not only at the clinical level, because I'm worried too many people get lost in coming to care. Mm -hmm. And rather than wait for people to become very ill, is there a way we can get them earlier and build community capacity to serve them earlier. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, that's where I would see my agenda. Uh, really more, more trying to get services earlier to people in a way that um, they find acceptable, that is feasible for them to uh, go, that works with their life circumstances. Mm -hmm. All the way from if you can't go to clinical care, we'll go to you. So we're doing care at home, we're doing care by phone, um, you name it, we're trying it, mm -hmm. so that sort of thing. That's, that's wonderful research and, and very broad um, in its, in its uh, depth and breadth. Um, I wanna kind of circle back to something that you've, you've mentioned twice, which is really about how hard it is to be a provider a clinician or a social worker specifically mm -hmm. in today's kind of health care system environment, you know, and, and how do you see, um, how do you see your research informing practice and, and what do you see as some of the challenges for social workers in the field today? Well, I think there are many challenges. Uh, I think the challenges are that people, especially social workers, are asked to do many, many things. So they have to be knowledgeable about evidence-based care. They have to have uh, more diagnostic skills. At the same time, they're being asked to fill in a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, data either in EPIC or in one of the systems um, for accountability and billing. Um, I think the requirements of uh, 
doing your work have gone higher. And that I think it's really having an impact in terms of having enough time to find out what's important for that patient. Mm -hmm. what, it, what do they really want you to help them with? And not only help them with, but also in doing uh, things that have to do with illness management, uh, information, uh, and, and in creating a very uh, connected relationship. So I think, I think it's harder and harder when you're being torn between your productivity, uh, having a time constraint, and also how often you can see that person. Uh, I think it's making it harder because it, it's sort of like you're asking people to do more with less. Right, and have better results. And have better results. And the accountability is such a big component of it mm -hmm. that I think sometimes people don't know what to target when they're in the clinical encounter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that resonates with what my experience in speaking with clinicians um, has been. I, I want to touch on something that we talked about on our way here today, which was about, you know, um, in the current study that you're doing, thinking about training of clinicians and really helping them and working with clients. If you could say a little bit about um, what the kind of philosophy of that mm -hmm. intervention is and how, uh, how you're finding it. Yeah, this is a NIDA study that we're doing from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And I think there are several components to it. So there are two studies that uh, we're trying to, I think, coach clinicians to be more effective and at the same time have a better relationship. On one aspect, I think uh, we're working very much on helping clinicians rather than telling the patient what they need to do, which is a constant sort of strategy that we all tend to use uh, telling more, helping the patient see what, what are their resources, given that you see patients now less and less, you know, or I would say less frequently. Uh, how can you help the patient find their own resources mm -hmm. or other resources to sort of answer their questions and become more activated? Mm -hmm. So we are actually training clinicians on how to generate questions for the a patient, but also be receptive to questions for the patients and try to get them to take more control over their health. Mm -hmm. This is actually harder to do because giving people advice is a lot easier than asking to see what pe would people do and how could you encourage them to look at their own resources mm -hmm. and look at alternatives. So, so that's one component. I think the other component that we're trying to do is how to have what we call cognitive empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, cognitive empathy means that if you take, it's sort of like if you become the best anthropologist mm -hmm. of this person, you'll be able to connect because you'll be able to really understand from where this person is coming, mm -hmm. what's significant to them, what, what, um, what is the most important aspects that they uh, value? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also connect with them in the sense of trying to understand why this person is doing that behavior or having these options. And this is one of the things we're teaching them is to see coming to care as a set of decisions that they're making and using decisions and options as a way to empower themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a different approach. Very different. It, um, yes, it, I think it is a very different approach in that it is really highlighting the skills and the experience of the person that's coming in for services and helping them um, and, and really seeking for the clinician to try to connect on that kind of values, what's important to you, what do I need to understand about you to help work with you to meet your goals. Exactly. Not my goals for exactly. you. Exactly, right? exactly. And actually, we, one of the things we uh, really work very strongly with is trying to find out the goals of the patient. Uh, and then you can tell them your goals too. It's not that you have to work only on the goals of the patient, but then the patient knows where are you going mm -hmm. and, and you know where the patient wants to go. So I think it's, it's a, a little more uh, cumbersome and probably harder to do, but I think we would be 
having patients be more satisfied with what they're getting out of care, which I don't think necessarily is the case always. Right, right. And do you have any kind of preliminary sense of how it's going? Uh, we, we, think, um, we think clinicians like it a lot. Um, it is very labor intensive because it is coaching on behaviors that you do while you're uh, in a clinical visit. So we actually code your behaviors. Uh, we hear the audio tape of that session and code them mm -hmm. and then give you that feedback. Right. Wow. And then we tell you like this is and give you actually a paper that has these are your areas of strengths, these are your areas of that you're pretty much average, and these are the areas where you could expand your repertoire. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they like it because it's mm -hmm. so targeted to you as a clinician. Right. Uh, and so we're not saying every clinician is the same, but we're actually saying, you know, each clinician has different strengths and weaknesses. And I think the other thing is we coach you on six different sessions mm. because we're saying sometimes you can be a great clinician and sometimes not such a great clinician. Mm -hmm. And it really, that di dyadic relationship mm -hmm. uh, makes a big difference. So it depends who comes through that door, right. how you interact. So I always tell people, there's not either good clinicians or bad clinicians. We're both. It just depends the circumstance. Right, right. That's great. Excellent. Because, you know, I think, um, you know, that my own research interest is around workforce development mm -hmm. and how to support frontline providers. So what you're saying really resonates in terms of thinking about the kind of feedback clinicians get. You know, in the moment, it's, it's very rare. Right. And so to be... Um, and, and I think clinicians are, are thirsty for knowledge about, you know, how am I doing? Where can I improve? You know, you have that voice um, inside you that says, you know, this is going well, or, you know, can I take a risk and ask a question here? You know, and so it's wonderful that, that you have uh, an ability to give clinicians the kind of feedback that maybe could inform how clinical supervision is done in the future. You know, as a, an aside, I know that's not the goal of, of your research or not the primary goal perhaps, but it's, it's really interesting to think about um, how to support providers mm -hmm. uh, in the field to do a better job and give them the tools. And you know, it's exactly that because providers, uh, we do all, at, uh, all sorts of levels. So providers that are starting to providers that have been in practice for 30 years. And they, they typically, I would tell you, like 95% tell us, I never, ever, ever receive uh, this detail feedback on what I think I'm doing. And you made me aware of things I was doing that I never um, have thought about or that are like maybe I thought I was doing a good job and now I'm thinking more reflectively. So I think it's exactly that, that I don't think we invest sufficiently in supporting our clinicians on an ongoing basis. Right. And it's not only continuing education, actually, I think it's more supporting them because we all start diverting into what we think is um, good clinical care. But um, like I, I coach in this uh, training, I say that's illusory because we actually sort of be think we're better because it gives us a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting your feedback, it really helps you become aware of things that you're tuning out just because of the way, you know, we have our own biases and our own stereotypes. And this is a way of trying to help you recognize them. 